Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes, my name's Evan Ash. I'm, uh, as mentioned, the Guidance Navigation Control Lead um, at Rocket Lab. Um, and uh, it is a very small world. Um, I spent uh, about eight years down here doing my uh, undergrad and PhD work, and uh, it's really a privilege to be here to talk to you all today, um, kind of getting back into the community that I was part of for quite a number of years. So um, thank you for coming along, and hopefully I can uh, give you a good, a good show today. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Rocket Lab, what we do. Um, I know probably all of you have got some idea of, of what we're trying to achieve, but um, I'm going to give you a bit of an idea of, of why we do what we do um, and why we're a little bit different from um, some of what else is out there. Um, I'm then going to give a little bit of an outline about how particularly my team, the GNC team, and the software development team at Rocket Lab operate. Um, I know there's a strong IT background in the audience, and so a little bit about our development process is how we go about um, developing new features, change management, that kind of stuff. Um, and then a, a little bit about the Canterbury connection. Um, there's some surprising work that happened in Canterbury before the Electron program, which I think played an interesting role in, um, in Rocket Lab as well. So I'd like to uh, tell a little bit about that story. Um, so the company Rocket Lab was founded in, in 2006 by Peter Beck. Um, he's from down south in Invercargill, and he, um, he had the vision early on uh, that that we could do this kind of stuff in New Zealand. So from that day forward, it's been uh, a massive uh, journey. We now have five sites in here in, uh, in New Zealand and the US. Um, we have fully integrated uh, design and development um, of our launch vehicle. Um, and as mentioned in J uh, January this year, we launched our first rocket, at, which reached orbit out of New Zealand. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So why do we do this? Why, why do we want to go to space? Obviously, plenty of people have done it before. It's a difficult thing. Um, but we do it to, to improve life on Earth. Now, I know that's a, a little bit of a cliche, everyone says that, but uh, we all rely on technology and space for all sorts of things, and it's, that reliance is only growing uh, stronger and stronger. Um, historically, it's been very difficult to put anything into space, um, expensive, time-consuming, and, and our aim is to change that um, so that we can have things like real-time Earth observation all, all the time, um, better global communications, disaster prediction, and probably many other interesting things that no one's thought about yet, but which are going to come to light once it becomes easy to get there. Now this is uh, a picture of a satellite, um, probably a, a few hundred million dollars, um, and, and the sort of the classic typical type of thing you might have seen launched um, over the past 25 years. Um, as you can imagine, quite a team required to, to build, design and launch that. Um, Today, thanks to Moore's Law, which has affected all of our lives profoundly in the last um, however long, uh, satellites, just like everything else, have been shrinking. Um, and this is, this is not what we launch, it's probably very, but it is an example of a very small uh, satellite um, that's actually capable of doing useful work. Um, now, more than 2,600 satellites need to be launched in the next five years, and that compares to around 1,000 launched in the last five years. Um, and so you can see that there's a massive demand. And in fact, uh, a lot of people have got a lot of great ideas uh, and they're just waiting for that opportunity to actually put these things on orbit and start, start using them. Um, so typically, these, these satellites have a particular mission. They all need to be on a particular schedule in a particular orbit. And unfortunately, up until now, they have to launch on something the size of this. Um, I, I don't know, there's not a lot for scale there, but that is a massive rocket. It's very expensive on the order of a couple of hundred million, if not more, US. Um, and normally small satellites um, will be launched on one of these as a rideshare. They might wait a few years to get on. Um, meanwhile, they're paying their engineering teams, that their technology is possibly becoming obsolete. We, and we aim to change that, and we are changing it. So this is Electron, um, and it's the future of the small satellite launch industry. Um, developed and designed and developed and first launched here in New Zealand um, by a team of a couple of hundred engineers based up in Auckland. Um, so it's a clean sheet design, uh, 150 kilo payload to a sun synchronous 500 kilometre orbit. Um, maximum payload of around 225 kilos. Now for comparison, the one you saw previously is probably on the order of a few tonnes to the same orbit. Um, but you don't need tonnes of electronics to do a useful job these days and I, that's the key point here. So this is a mass producible, uh, designed for mass production um, and a rapid launch schedule um, and really aimed to try and break down those barriers to space. Now in order to achieve this, um, Rocket Lab's chosen uh, the vertical integration path. Um, we've designed almost everything that we, we use in-house. 
um, engines, uh, propellant tanks, avionics, flight software, ground software, testing facilities, mission design. All of these aspects are um, key parts of the whole process to get a payload to orbit. Um, and vertical integration really allows us to have uh, a, a very tight control um, over that process and over the feedback loops between the various teams. <clears throat> now, the, the typical process um, in the US would be more of a contractor uh, type approach, um, which is great as well. Um, but for us, we've found that the vertical integration is um, really important. Um, so that's a little bit about the company, sort of the, the really high level aspect of how we operate. Um, but what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about the development process, particularly for the software um, and, uh, and uh, GNC um, work. Now, you may not associate uh, rockets too much with software development um, initially, but as, as we can probably all imagine here in this room, uh, nothing really works particularly well these days without some software in the background, or potentially the foreground as well. So we have quite a, a large software development process, or a lot of software development team, probably on the order of 30, 40 um, software engineers spanning everything from web development through to UI development through to embedded systems and um, even FPGA uh, work. Um, and those teams, one of which is, uh, is mine, is um, sort of acting in a support role uh, in terms of making sure that everything uh, glues together really nicely. So what's our development process? Now, one of the things about rockets, it's, it's about the most multidisciplinary type of uh, equipment that you can possibly imagine designing. Um, we have, we're trying to burn uh, tons of propellant in a very short space of time. We have really tight uh, performance requirements around the mass of how everything weighs, uh, really extreme environments, high vibration environments, very particular requirements around timing of things. Um, and the thing about a space rocket is once you let it go, if something goes wrong, uh, you're basically, well, you're in big trouble, let's put it that way. <laughs> I think I'm on YouTube, so. Um, so in terms of managing uh, that, all of that into a successful launch, um, clearly process and how we go about that is, is a really important aspect. We can't just start developing a rocket and five years later with, without careful planning uh, reach that goal. So requirements management, um, verification and validation processes, and particularly clear process and procedure um, is, is a really important part of that. Um, and I guess the biggest mantra that we've had from the start at Rocket Lab is, is testing. Often, testing early, testing often, and particularly the phrase test what you fly and fly what you test. Now that, that might seem obvious um, to do that, but uh, it's not always easy to test equipment in the exact environment that it's going to encounter. Um, particularly if that involves supersonic speeds and, and various heating regimes and cryogenics and all sorts of uh, environments that we can't really necessarily reproduce very easily. Um, and so a big part of our process is, is trying to work out how do we get all that tested in an appropriate manner before we, we let the thing go um, and, and uh, not have to hope for the best. So the process that we go through um, has been honed over, over years. I, I joined um, right at the beginning of the Electron program. Um, and uh, you know, over those years, we've really learned a lot and, and developed a pretty robust process for going, you know, going through particularly change nowadays. Requirement development at the start is something that um, often people forget to do formally, and it's a really important part of making sure we understand what we need to do. Uh, change assessment, understanding all the impact of that change, um, and then eventually the design and implementation, which will often be multidisciplinary, uh, mechanical engineering, electronic, ele uh, electrical and electronic hardware design, uh, software design, um, and a lot of multidimensional sort of physics analysis, finite element, uh, coupled loads, thermal analysis. Um, everything has to be just right in order to make it on board. Um, that will be followed by verification and validation. Um, now it's an integrated system, so we need to do that across uh, the entire system, um, both at an individual system level and as an integrated test. And obviously revision control um, becomes very important as well. Um, when we're trying to support multiple different vehicles with multiple different missions um, all at the same time. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I mean, again, that's fairly high level. I'm gonna delve into a little bit more detail about the software and GNC development process. 
Um, now, the reason these two things are separate, we, we have a, a slight uh, division of labour, I guess, at Rocket Lab when it comes to these aspects. The guidance, navigation and control team write a lot of software for simulations um, and also a lot of the algorithm kind of work and scheduling. Software team uh, are more involved in the low-level embedded work and they do a lot of the user interface uh, work as well. And we work really closely to, to test that all, um, test all of that work as a team. Um, so the process for us, you'll see at the bottom um, here, there's, as we go through this process, we have a continually reducing tolerance for the failure of our work um, to, to operate correctly. So I've mentioned the multidisciplinary architectural design already. That will be followed by simulation work and configuration development to give us an environment to test our code in. Um, also in parallel embedded software development um, and onboard software work for onboard the vehicle, associated ground systems development. Obviously those will have to communicate with each other so communication protocol and all that kind of stuff feeds in as well. Um, that will go through a continuous in integration testing environment which I'm sure most of you are, are well familiar with, uh, followed by hardware in the loop testing which I'll, I'll go into more detail in, in just a second and eventually a stack test, which is an integrated test of an entire stage to make sure that it's operating correctly before we're willing to fly it. Eventually, um, we'll reach flight. Now, as you can imagine, it's, it's kind of okay if someone makes a mistake um, early on in this process. We've got a number of processes in place to, fit, to find it, code review. By the time we reach the far right, um, any mistake that's been made that hasn't been caught could be catastrophic. Um, and you know, we're risking the reputation of our company the, uh, the customer payloads um, uh, and, and everything else if we get that wrong. So clearly this, this process is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, now continuous integration, um, I believe we have a new DevOps uh, engineer starting who will be fam becoming very familiar with this. You may have been alluding to him, I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Welcome on board. Um, so. Continuous integration, really important, um, something we've put a lot of effort into um, from the very beginning, really. Um, so every feature branch will obviously do unit tests and code coverage, that's all kind of pretty standard. Um, for us, though, not just you know, the, the full flights to orbit and running those in simulation, Monte Carlo analysis, and verification that the code that we've written and the way we've configured it will meet the individual customer requirements for that mission is also uh, carried out in, in continuous integration testing. I mentioned the mantra test early and test often, and I guess for, for a software system, there's no better time than at the, at the point of each commit from a developer. Um, nothing makes it pass to the main branch if it doesn't pass CI first. That's a hard and fast rule. Um, and obviously, breaking the build is fairly well frowned upon, like it would be in just about any <laughs> software uh, house, I imagine. Um, I'd be interested to hear what sort of punishments are out there for that kind of behaviour. I've heard some interesting ones in the past. Um, now, I mentioned hardware in the loop testing. It's all very well testing code and simulation, um, but when it comes to an embedded system with, you know, I think we've got at least 20 different computers running on board the vehicle, all talking to each other, talking to the ground. Um, we're trying to do real-time control with that, so the speed at which that communication executes, the delays in the system all become important. Um, and we're talking milliseconds here. It could make the difference between a pass and a fail in a real flight. Then testing how all of this software interacts with each other uh, in, on the real hardware is a very important part of what we do. So in order to achieve that, we have a hardware in the loop testing rig. Um, now on the left here, you, you can see some mock engines. So those are actually um, mass simulators for all nine engines on our first stage. The blue and red uh, things you can see there are some linear actuators which operate our thrust vectoring system in order to point our engines where we want them to go and carry out um, our, our attitude control. And on the right, um, you can, it's just, a, I guess, a snapshot of some of the less sensitive avionics who don't tend to publish images like this very often. Um, now this rig basically is a gateway um, for any new software uh, and hardware to be tested very thoroughly before it's ever allowed to go onto any real equipment. Um, so it's a, it's a very important part of our testing phase and nothing will ever make it onto a real piece of equipment, be it an engine, a stage or, or a flight vehicle before it's had a very thorough checkout on the hardware in the loop rig. 
Um, so what happens when we put this all together? I mentioned a stack test. Um, we'll put all of the software, hardware, engines, tanks, uh, all together. We do thorough checkouts. But the, the ultimate test is obviously actually hot firing the thing and making sure that it's performing exactly as expected. Um, and I've got a quick video here, uh, which gives you an idea. I do apologise for the, for the music. Probably a little over the top. So um, that's what will, um, will happen uh, just before we fly, we'll then ship that to the, to the, um, to the launch site and away we go. So I'm going to have to hurry up here. Very, very quickly, I've, I've gone a little bit over time, but um, there's, a, there's a connection to Canterbury that um, not many people know about. Um, early on, um, back in 2009, there's a group of us doing a whole lot of rocketry research um, down here. and. Um, this stuff, and this is not from Rocket Lab, so I, they'd be embarrassed about this. This is, this is very amateur, so I just make that very clear. Um, but this stuff led to quite a number of folks from Canterbury who've ended up um, playing some fairly significant roles in the development of the Electron launch vehicle. Um, so that, sparked, that early stuff sparked off a rocketry course um, at UC, um, led by one of the professors there. Uh, this is playing, there we go. So that was some very early Awful, awful avionics that we developed. It's a, a rather embarrassing photo of me. <laughs> um, and eventually managed to launch a rocket. Um, we thought it was pretty cool at the time. Clearly, we had a lot to learn about what's really cool when <laughs> it comes to rockets. Um, that, that led to some PhD research, um, uh, which eventually led to quite a number of um, folks. Uh, the propulsion lead um, who developed the Rutherford engine that you saw. Uh, myself, quite a number of our team, and a number of avionics team members and other folks from Canterbury making a really big contribution. I did have another video which I'm going to skip because I think I've run out of time. Um, but what happens when we put this all together? Um, it's a whole, whole lot of work, it's a lot of testing, it's a lot of long hours. Um, sometimes it's great fun, sometimes it's really difficult, but um, this is what we get at the end of it. And I hope I have enough time to finish this video. In all stations, this is flight on mission cord. We're starting terminal count at this time. Clock is T minus 12 minutes. Mark T minus 12 minutes and counting. FSO LC on mission cord. Are you confirm? Confirm. FTS, confirm FTS is green. FTS is green on internal power. <laughs> PMS, LC on mission code. Can LC? Confirm all separation events are armed. Confirmed. RLM, this is flight on mission code. Re verify cola windows and confirm release of the T minus two hour balloon. RM, LC on LV code. Commence fire suppression system test. Stage one locks pressed. Stage two locks pressed. Flight vehicle is ready. T minus 10 seconds. Three, two, one. 
Liftoff. Liftoff confirmed. Vehicle is cleared to pad. Stage two engine ignited. Stage separation succeed. Vehicle's a little. Engine set down. That footage was, was New Zealand reaching orbit for the very first time. Um, we're a proud moment for both the company, but hopefully for the whole country as well. Now, I'm going to wrap up very quickly here. Um, I know I'm out of time, but I guess one of the questions I've been asked a lot, and we get asked a lot um, all the time, is why would we do that here? Um, you know, we hear that a lot. Whenever if someone does something new that hasn't been done in New Zealand before. Well, what I've realised is that we, we've got all of the ingredients to do good things. We've got education, peop the right people, the right attitude, the right environment. We're gaining quite a reputation. Um, funding sometimes is a little difficult, but we're getting there. Um, and so the question that I think we need to ask ourselves instead, um, and it's people like you that, as well as Rocket Lab that are allowing us to do that, is why not? We've got everything we need, why not? Let's, let's make that the question that we ask ourselves from now on. Um, cheers. All righty. Oh. <laughs> no, I sounded like that. Thank you so much. That was an awesome, awesome um, presentation. We've got a couple of questions. Um, with testing and flights, a lot of fuel must be used. How do you tie in environmental sustainability and development? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so. The thing about what we do is that each of these flights uses about the same amount of fuel as a 747 would, would flying, I think, from here to Singapore. Don't quote me on that, but it's on that order. So obviously, uh, the amount of fuel we use is a really important consideration. Um, but we, we hope that the net, net benefit um, is much, much better than that, given it's actually quite a small amount compared with the number of flights there would be per day. But the amount, amount that we can get out of what the satellites that we're going to launch hopefully will allow us to really do a lot better in the environmental area. area. So um, I guess that, that's our view there. Nice. At one, at one stage, Birdling's Flat was proposed as a launch site. Is that still an option for the future? Yeah, another good question. Um, I, I'm not really involved in the launch site. Um, obviously, the more of these we need to launch, um, the more launch sites we'll need. At this point, we're, we're really happy with Mahia. Um, but I don't think we'd rule anything out. What is your current cost per kilo of payload, and how does that compare to the competition? Um, I don't actually know our cost per kilo, um, but for us, what we know what's more important is how quickly we can launch, um, launching on time, uh, reducing the lead time, um, and reducing the the, cap the you know the, the absolute cost of putting a satellite into orbit. Um, you know, an engineering team is expensive to maintain, and the quicker you can get to market, the better off you are. So, you know, the cost per kilo is bound to be higher than a, a $200 million launch vehicle that can launch tons. Um, but, you know, that's not the most important thing here. Cool. And that is the end of the questions. Just a reminder if you want to ask questions, please use Slido. Um, Oh dear. Yep. <laughs> okay, so the question for Breva, because they can't hear you as delicious as your voice is, do you have any hookups? It was a hookup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just, just to see if I blush, do you, do you liaise with any high schools? Um, I'm not going to use either of those two words, but we. <laughs> we, we do um, we do do work with a number of high schools. So if if there is one you've got in mind, just get in touch with our communications team. Nice. And I promise I did not ask this question. What are the biggest challenge to using DevOps processes for embedded software development? <laughs> I think that's one for another day. <laughs> we'll get there. I agree. <laughs> uh, do you have a greater weather window for launches than SpaceX? Um, I don't know, actually. I don't know what SpaceX's window is. Um, we have been very cautious in the past with our test launches, but our, our window's increasing quite rapidly now, so. Cool. 
what I'll do is I'll wait, you know, 30 seconds for any more questions. For anyone who wants to yell out questions. <laughs> Can I? Yeah, sure. Uh, what's the government expecting back from Rocket Lab? The question was, what is the government expecting back from Rocket Lab? Um, I'm not entirely sure. You'd have to ask the government. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, you know, what I think we're giving back is really good opportunities for, you know, engineers, um, you know, all sorts of people, um, and hopefully we're making life better for everyone, um, which is, you know, a goal that we all have. So um, hopefully we're making a good contribution there. All right, one more question. Yeah, sure. The question was, when is the next launch? Ooh, I, I don't know if we've announced that yet. Um, so all I'll say is soon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ch check our website. I honestly don't know what we've announced. So, nice. yeah. Well, look, mate, thank you so much for your session.